Welcome, everybody, to the uh, seventh episode of the Wonder and All podcast. I'm Louis Schwartzberg, and I'm going to be your host. I know a lot of you know me from the films I make that celebrate life, making the invisible visible by taking viewers on journeys through time and scale, focusing on important planetary issues like fantastic fungi. My work has always combined the science and the why of art, and I've always seen Wonder and Awe as the intersection between art and science. And this podcast fills that sweet spot. And what I've learned over many years of personal experience in filmmaking is that immersion in nature increases our capacity for courage, creativity, kindness, and compassion to components we need to save our world. That's why I'm really proud that today's podcast is supported by the Fetzer Institute. They're helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us?, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. You can explore these findings and more at spiritualitystudy.org. I want to invite you to also share your questions for our guests throughout the live podcast. And please submit your questions in the comments section of the live stream broadcast. Our team will be reading them all. So don't forget to tell us where you're writing from so we can feel your global connection. This is the mycelial network reaching around the globe, connecting us all, especially at a time during this pandemic when disconnection seems to be our biggest problem. My three guests today have spent years fighting for the right to use nature's pharmacy for, medic for medicinal purposes, respecting and acknowledging the indigenous cultural knowledge of how to use these sacred medicines to heal mind, body, and soul. Today, I'm really proud to welcome Sherry Eckert and Tom Eckert to the podcast. Sherry and Tom are both co-founders and architects of Oregon Psilocybin Therapy Measure, and Tom and Cherie are counselors focused on helping people do inner work to live a more connected life. Together, they've helped promote the health and healing benefits of psilocybin in patients dealing with anxiety, depression, and addiction. I also want to welcome my dear friend, David Bronner, to the Wonder and Awe podcast. He's an internationally recognized leader and is a senior executive at the family's business, Dr. Bronner's Magic Soaps, and is known for his activism around animal rights, sustainable agriculture, and drug reform policy. He's helped fight the DEA for the right to use hemp in products, and he's won. I want to tell you how I first met Sherry and Tom. You know, they'd heard about Fantastic Fungi and saw the film and then reached out to me before we ever did a theatrical release. And so they convinced me to come up to Portland and uh, they were going to have a fundraiser on a Sunday afternoon. I fly up to Portland and um, while we put up that graphic, I walk up to the marquee and <laughs> my mind was blown. You know, there it was, fantastic fungi sold out under this giant banner called Hollywood. That had never happened to me before. And we ended up filling that theater just because Tom and Sherry had you know put on the Facebook page for the Oregon Psilocybin Society that we're having the screen. And I could feel the love in the lobby. I could see everybody hugging and connecting, people that are into foraging, environmental consciousness, psychedelics, healers, spiritual people, you know, um, uh, gardeners, all these incredible groups that overlap. So it, I got to let the audience know it was that screening that convinced me to go independent and distribute the film ourselves because we had been rejected by just about every major distributor or sub distributor saying that there wasn't a market or an audience for this movie. And I was at this crossroads not knowing really what to do. And that screening was the, the mushrooms and the mycelial network speaking to me saying do it because there is an audience and the most incredible passionate audience one could ever imagine so so sherry and tom i know you you fought to get this you know measure passed to allow the use of psilocybin 
in clinical supervised settings to treat mental illness in the state of Oregon. Considering in this pandemic right now, where mental illness is going to be a significant problem coming out of it, I want you to explain to our listeners how you were able to get the initiative passed and what kept you going. Well, thanks for having us, Louis. I uh, really appreciate being here. Yeah, you know, you hit on part of it, just building a coalition. You know, a lot of energy on the ground, a lot of interest in, in these kind of general topics. Even people who hadn't done uh, psychedelics or psilocybin were gravitated to just the, the healing energy, the sense of being connected uh, to nature. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a, an incredible unfolding over five years. We started way back in 2015. And, uh, yeah, no one was talking about uh, policy reform and psychedelics back then. Um, although there was an FDA approval process that had gotten started, and that was certainly very inspiring to us. Um, but it kicked off a, a process that just kept growing and growing. Uh, lots of transition points along the way where we had to thread a needle to get to the next stage. And we can certainly, David coming on board was one of those important junctures. Um, yeah, and, and we were so excited about uh, Fantastic Fungi when we had been out for about three and a half years educating Oregonians yeah. at different places like the, the Oregon Country Festival and with Paul Stamets um, at the Newmark in yeah. downtown Portland. That was so amazing. And then to put Fantastic Fungi up at the Hollywood Theater and it sold out within days. Yeah. Pe people were so interested in them. The most exciting thing about that is it, it was people like, like you said, Louis, from a diverse background, like people who were into um, gathering um, mushrooms to eat, people who were looking at using mushrooms for medicinal purposes, for bettering their health. And then people- just ecology and yeah. just the, there's a mindset, isn't there? You know, there's a, a mindset that recognizes the power of holistic thinking, I would say. Uh, and certainly from a psychological point of view, this is what really fascinates Sheree and I is kind of the underlying uh, philosophical orientation toward transformation and growth that the psilocybin experience certainly accelerates. I think it's within us all to kind of reconnect. Uh, so yeah, early on we were inspired uh, by that experience and everything it entails. And I'm mm -hmm. sure we can dig in more in different ways on yeah. that subject. Well, one of the great things about uh, the Hollywood showing was that it actually helped us to see that there were people outside of, let's say the um, psychedelic world, yeah. because we had particularly been speaking to that audience for a while. Mm -hmm. And it really opened our eyes to the 1.3 million people in the state of Oregon that exist that, you know, we're so excited to see this natural fungi come into their world to provide them opportunities for growth experiences, to provide them opportunities for healing addictions and depression and anxiety. And personal growth as well. By the way, she brings up 1.3 million because that's how many people voted for Measure 109. <laughs> so we, we like to throw that number in. Um, <laughs> and David and I were really excited, like, from the beginning, we're, we're like, we've got this, we've got this. And even though sometimes the numbers didn't support our enthusiasm, right, David? <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely was a hill to climb, but just incredible. I mean, I think it, you, you guys had the vision, um, you know, having this, um, you know, have a B, have psilocybin therapy be available outside of the medical pharma model. Um, you know, uh, you know, likewise, we, we owe so much to the clinical researchers at John Hopkins and NYU and UCLA, you know, Roland Griffiths and, and, and all for their just pioneering work, showing the efficacy for of psilocybin therapy for treatment resistant depression, end of life anxiety, addiction, substance use disorders. Um, but w when, when psilocybin therapy is approved, that's the only people who are gonna be able to access that therapy are those with those like, specific diagnoses. And as we all know, psilocybin is awesome for all of us. We're all struggling with the dilemmas of life. We're all on the spectrum of everything. And, um, and the model that Tom and Cherie saw of bringing it into the therapy frame, the therapeutic frame, the way you would access therapy or acupuncture or a, chiro a chiropractor, like that's the correct model. 
right. um, that, you know, all adults who can safely access should be able to access in a, you know, in a more affordable, straightforward program. So, you know, it was, it was just um, really amazing to, to meet Thomas Shree and get to know them, and uh, connect with Shree over, uh, she's got uh, Holocaust trauma in her family and uh, as do I, and um, just the importance of, you know, processing on a deep level, generationally, and for each of us individually, but then collectively uh, helping us um, heal up and reconnect and deal with all the complex karma of our collective inheritance and structural injustices and, and and racism and everything and, and just try to be the generation that can exercise all that stuff and be a much more compassionate uh, society and collective and start enacting the policies and behavior change that we need to you know enact here to get through this crisis we're in right so, yeah you know it's really interesting to, you, know, you mentioned David that you know I guess all of us have a pinch of like um, uh, resilience of overcoming um, Holocaust, you know, uh, trauma. Um, you know, my parents were, you know, uh, survivors of Auschwitz. Mm. Uh, David, just before we jumped on the call, he shared with me the story about your grandfather, you know, and 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 Sher Sheri and Tom, I, you know, I know there's like, you know, trauma almost, you know, in your lives or almost most people's lives. The fact that you know, there's a sacred molecule that indigenous cultures have known for thousands and thousands of years that can help, you know, heal mind, body, and soul is a miracle that nature has provided. And the fact that we have to, you know, fight government, you know, laws and regulations that was actually put the, put put on on the table by a crazy guy named Richard Nixon mm -hmm. in order to fight his political enemies, the anti-war protesters, women, people of color. People didn't vote for him, right? That's what made psilocybin illegal. And that has no logic at all. And so I love the fact that there are these roots that go back to these experiences. You know, David, I gotta share with you, the first time I, I encountered um, Dr. Bronner's soap was because I was eating a hamburger at UCLA and I was a student there on the quad. And my buddy of mine, this African-American friend of mine named Charlie, came up to me with a giant old afro. He goes, Louie, he goes, you're eating a corpse. And mm. things like that. I just, a light bulb went off of my brain. And I became, you know, plant-based, you know, diet. And back then, the only health food stores that existed in all of L.A. was this little tiny store that had all these, like, pills all, mm. all over the place, no produce. And there was, you know, Dr. Bronner's soap, which was, you know, the only organic, healthy soap you could use. And I'll never forget, and I still to this day, you know, enjoy taking a shower and reading the stream of consciousness on that label, which goes on and on. And it's just so incredible and so deeply honored that um, you have actually put my name and Paul Stamets name. Um, maybe we can blow that up in the lower right hand corner saying how we are all part of this one big family. So um, thank you for like the billboard, you know, presence on the label. I hope that people take a long enough shower to read the whole thing and get to the bottom. But um, Dave, <laughs> a little bit about, you know, your grandfather, like, I mean, it seems like in every generation, there are change agents who are spiritual and, and conscious and, um, so why don't you share like how did that all happen? <clears throat> yeah, so so my granddad, Dr. Bronner, um, uh, so his his grandfather started manufacturing soap in a small German village of Laupheim in the in the Jewish quarter there. So my family was German Jewish soap makers. Um, I, I myself am a quarter Ashkenazi, and then seventy five percent Scandinavian and German. Uh, otherwise. Um, but really resonate to my Jewish heritage, very connected to it. Um, and so my granddad, um, he came of age in the guild system of the time. So by the time he came of age in, in the late twenties, uh, he was apprenticed to another family as, as was how, how he did it, um, to, to learn the craft of soap making, had like the equivalent of like a, a bachelor's in chemistry from, from university. Um, and he was pretty intense and activist from, from day one and very Zionist. Um, 
you know, at the time, you know, the, the idea that Jews weren't safe anywhere and, and needed a, a homeland. And his and he was clashing with his dad and uncles who were running the show at that point. And and by then, they had built the family enterprise up to be one of the largest sewmakers in Germany. We had a factory in Heilbronn, where uh, where our name how we were Heilbronners. Um, even before we moved to Laupine, we must have been in Heilbronn. And I think Napoleon rolled through and made Jews uh, change their last names or something. But um, uh, so, so my grandfather just out of, out of clashing with his, his dad a bunch and kind of out of that generational conflict and just wanting to forge his own path, came to the States in 29 at the age of 21 and was a consultant for the U.S. soap industry, helped uh, to launch products and build factories. and. Um, met my grandmother and had three kids, and but also with the rise of Hitler. And just to be clear, in '29, you know, the dimensions of Nazi and, and Hitler were not clear yet, so he wasn't coming over for that reason. Um, but obviously, soon enough, got increasingly desperate to get his family out. And his two sisters, his two younger sisters, got out. Um, uh, Lottie got out in '36 and ended up on a kibbutz in then Palestine and, uh, and you know, now Israel. Um, and Louisa got out in 38, right before the close of borders. But his parents, like a lot of bourgeois Jews, thought they were going to ride out the madness and um, stay till it was too late. The factory was Aryanized in 1940, and they were deported and killed shortly after. Um, also in this time, my grandmother uh, was in and out of hospitals, and, and she died in, I think, 1944, when my dad was really young. Um, so my grandma was just going through an enormous tragedy. And somehow, like his response to this was to have these, these huge mystical breaks and insights. Uh, and and fundament, his fundamental vision was that in a nuclear armed world, if we don't realize our transcendent unity across religious and ethnic divides, that the next Holocaust, we're going to all perish. And, uh, and that we're all children of the same transcendent source. Uh, the, you know, we're all children. Uh, you know, it's like everyone prays to. God or goddess in his or her own language, and there's no language goddess doesn't understand idea, and felt urgently called to uh, uh, go across the country lecturing on this peace plan. And as he uh, and he was selling his family soap, natural biodegradable concentrated soaps on the side, and word was getting out that this is pretty gosh darn dang good soap, and people were coming to just get the soap and not really stick around to hear what he had to say. So that's when he put his message on the bottle of our soap. And you know, the famous message you're, you're referring to, and it's basically about the one true religion of love at the heart of all faith traditions, and you know, quotes Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, Buddha, trying to show the commonality of insight. And um, and you know, the, the genius is uh, you know, if you forget a magazine and you go to the bathroom, he's got you. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally. I think people. I think people really uh, read it more on the counter, or it's, I use it in my kitchen as well. And it's it's wonderful just to pick it up and spend two minutes and read each new bottle. Uh, it's great messages, and it is that all one mentality. And I see that Dr. Bronner's labels as a way of helping each of us to realize that we are all one. To we are and should be connected in a a more visible and a also spiritual way regardless of our religious background mm -hmm. and i think that when we can actually achieve that when we can say it's okay for all of us to come together and be one humanity we will have arrived to some place we haven't been yet mm -hmm. and i think that the dr bronner soaps uh really help individuals millions of individuals to kind of get that first introduction to what is consciousness? What does it mean to be all one? And it's warm and inviting and you walk away with, I do want to be all one. And so when Tom and I um, were preparing this uh, draft for the measure that passed about five years ago, um, it was so interesting that we were both really connected on the realm of consciousness, but Tom had a little bit more experience with the um, with the sacred spirit medicines than mm -hmm. I did. And I was pretty much square. I was pretty new to the whole thing. But I do remember, because my family does have a, a really strong um, Jewish, on both sides, my mother and my father, uh, heritage. 
And one time when, um, in the very first time that I had a psilocybin experience, I, I felt like my mind was really ready. And what happened is that I wept for about three to four hours. I just wept. I didn't sob, but just weeping was coming out of my, my soul. And I really believe that that experience with the, with the sacred mushroom took all of that ancestral pain that I wasn't consciously aware of and, and all of the pain that came with just growing up in a very traumatic uh, childhood. And it just let it out. Mm -hmm. It was not what I was expecting, but it's exactly what I needed. And, you know, that's the beauty of mm -hmm. psilocybin. And I think that's the thing that we really want to see anybody who can safely uh, use this medicine to be able to do it because you might go in with one intention and get exactly what you want. Uh, but a lot of times you have an experience that you weren't expecting, like the experience I had. Right. And it was revelational. And I so desire, I can't wait for Oregonians to have this chance to, you know, have this therapeutic experience. To do it in a safe way too. Yeah. It's a very vulnerable, delicate experience. And to be able to set up uh, environments that are conducive to the experience with a facilitator who's well-trained to kind of get out of the way of the experience, but allow it to be optimized uh, because any little um, nuance can move the experience this way or that. Uh, so it's really important to do it right and carefully. But again, we think it should be available to anyone who can safely access because you know, it's about the human condition. It's not about a, a, a diagnosis, diagnosis or a protocol per se. It's about the human right. condition. Well, look, I, I, I just want to share really quickly some an update, which I may not have shared with you, but I'm really thrilled to let you guys know and let the audience know that starting in January, we're going to be doing a clinical trial with the Pacific Neuroscience Institute here in Santa Monica at St. John's Hospital where we're using psilocybin to treat alcohol addiction. So there'll be a therapist who administers the psilocybin treatment, but uh, as they're first coming on to the experience, they're gonna be watching a 40 minute video of mine, which will <laughs> you know, take them through incredible rhythms and patterns of nature so that they can, I think, feel the oneness and also relax and you know, be able to kind of slide into that space of you know, loss of ego, as we've all read about, you know, books like Michael Pollan and the stuff that Paul Stamets talks about as well, to be able to, you know, let go and have a spiritual experience. I mean, you know, I was raised in a Jewish, you know, household as well. And I really appreciated like things like the Ten Commandments, but I can honestly say I never really felt spiritual, but until I had you know, this type of an experience. So I'm thrilled. I'm kind of pinching myself. I get to make a movie for a patient that's going on a mushroom journey. Although I'm sure in the underground, there are a lot of people that are watching my movies and doing the same thing as well. I've heard that from a lot of uh, underground practitioners. But I'm happy that we're able to finally cross over, you know, to get the clinical data, to have the efficacy, to really show that all of these things are healing modalities. You know, nature is powerful. Why would it make a molecule that can open the portal, you know, to, to the divine that opens your heart? You know, why, why do the rhythms and patterns of nature help you heal quicker? You know, there's factual scientific evidence that, can, that supports that as well. So combining the two, it's never been done before. And mm -hmm. I'm just kind of tickled pink that we're able to do it. And sure. you know, and guys and David, you know, you're you were one of the first people who stepped up and you know helped me with the movie. You know, I remember at Cavallo Point, I was like I was speaking for that group of young people that are helping the environment. I forgot yeah. the name of the organization. We had right. never met before, and you came up to me and you said, "I want to help you." Yeah, yeah. that was Teens Turning Green. Yeah, and, uh, Teens Turning Green, and I remember, man, it was so impressive because you were the keynote. 
And you were just telling them, talking on the reel to basically these like 17 and 18 year olds about, you know, you're taking them through all, all the, these gorgeous, you know, n nature uh, time lapses and just uh, kind of all the beauty that you, that you capture and show and reveal. Uh, but also talking on the reel about psychedelic experience and how positive it was for you and you hope for them. And I'm like, wow, wow, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, at that point, I wasn't like talking quite that openly to especially high schoolers. And uh, I just was so impressed. And this, the way you did it and the way it was received, it was so awesome. And, but, you know, really the, the origin of my uh, fandom and, and appreciation was, uh, um, well, I mean, first of all, just intrinsically, I just, I'm, I'm blown away. And I really think being able to show different time scales like you do is just really crucial and just really reveals like, you know, a dimension of our reality and experience that's, you know, the cycles of life and we're in cycles within cycles and just really understanding that is uh, awesome, especially when it's so gorgeous and, and beautiful. And and I wanted to share that my daughter, um, uh, when they were 16, had their first cannabis experience uh, with me and wanted to, I was like, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want to watch moving art. So we just watched like a bunch of Schwarzenberg videos for like 90 minutes. Like, like it was just awesome and so it was so awesome wow. so so yeah and i really i mean i was just so happy to because obviously your your art and and film lends itself to psychedelic experience already and actually uh you know go deep in with fantastic fungi and you know and you're really kind of in there uniting the twin passions that we that i have and michael Collin has as well of regenerative agriculture and organic agriculture and understanding the importance of fungal uh, mycorrhizae and microbiota and soil generally as crucial for both wild ecosystem as well as farm ecosystem health and that we need to shift our farming and, and, and dietary choice to regenerative basis that is you know rewarding farmers who are uh, taking care of their land and farms in, in a way that builds soil and, instead of killing it and making it into a dead inert medium that uh, is so, so unhealthy and, and we're getting our crops to, to harvest with more and more pesticide right. fertilizers that's just making you know it's just this horrible cycle around and then also the psychedelic healing side you know bring you know obviously in my life you know you showed the heal soul label there um that we did uh you know a temper heal earth and then heal earth was about regenerative organic agriculture and then heal soul this year was all about psychedelic assisted therapy and medicines and the healing power and um and well, you know what I that that uh, whole concept of regenerative regenerative soil and that re using uh, wonderful ways to be smart uh, about how we we do, we do agriculture. It's like our spirit is also the soil. Mm -hmm. It's the soil, and the regeneration comes from connecting with that that um, the fungi that actually gives you the chance to reconnect and, and rewire. Yeah, yeah we're all little like, like earthworms in soil. Yeah, exactly. Global soil. <laughs> I've always, I've always thought about that, yeah, the way our consciousness works, you know, you, we get locked up in boxes. We see it in our architecture and various things, you know, and that's a reflection of the way we think. So these new ways of thinking, these loosening, loosening up and creating flexibility in the way we uh, experience reality will reflect out into the world ultimately firstly it's an internal process and i think just yeah. to name the revolutionary aspect of of the of psilocybin as medicine is that it's experiential right it's not a pill that you're taking day to day to tweak brain chemicals to suppress symptoms yeah. it's instead going the other direction and opening up the box yeah inside yeah. yourself and th there's been a taboo around that quite interestingly it's yeah. like the last taboo is to kind of open yeah. up that fully and i think it's important that we do and i'm so uh, uh gratified that in oregon we're taking those steps in a really smart and careful way i think that's yeah. great and, and you know just, just wanted to also the, the the how do you say the inactive placebo of modern religion you know like i, I was raised christian i said the shema uh, in hebrew and english uh, uh, along with my christian prayer um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't have any real experience and, and my granddad, what he was talking about was going way over my head for my whole life until I had like some really profound psychedelic experiences and realized, oh my God, you know, my God is totally right. It's like, this is exactly this transcendent mystery of love and light and reconnection and awesomeness. 
is uh, at the heart of all the faith traditions when they're not demonizing each other and making idols out of their beliefs. Um, and, and just that label, in, in so in some ways, like I feel like this is the most on point of my with my granddad's mission and vision of unifying spaceship Earth in this kind of common religious understanding that the psych like this heal soul is the most like of all the different activist projects we do, like the integration of psychedelic medicine is most crucial and most on point. And yeah, I was just really gratified to, and it's just temporary. We're not doing a permanent label change, but really gratified to shout out. Yeah. Fantastic fun guy. Uh, in, well, you know, you know, what's really beautiful is that I knew we were all connected by the mycelium network, but in this conversation for the first time, you know, I realized we all have the shared, you know, Jewish heritage and um, you know, the, the, you know, going back to, you know, thousands of years, I mean, uh, tikkun olam, that's the mission of Judaism is he, heal the world. That's why you're here is to heal the world. And so that mes the message resonates throughout time. And it seems like obviously um, governments and, you know, certain like, you know, you know uh, constraints evolved that want to squash that idea of being connected to the divine, of, of, of being, you know, feeling that sense of mission. And, um, you know, what, what I really thought was interesting is that we were talking bef before all these like pillars overlap, the idea of like foraging, permaculture, you know, environmental consciousness, um, all of those things are amazing for like healing the planet. But guess what? I'm really amazed that maybe it's like a moral compass because David, you have sort of instituted in your company a guideline for how you treat your employees mm -hmm. through the formula that you know uh, you know that compensates your workers based on the formula of how much you get compensated. Would you share that with us? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a five to one executive compensation cap, um, and uh, so early on, I could see where the business was going, and we're you know we're a social venture. My granddad founded the company as a nonprofit religious organization. Uh, the IRS disagreed with that uh, tax exempt self designation, and we were in bankruptcy, paying a lot of back taxes, um, and you know eventually exited as a for profit. And my dad and mom and uncle uh, really put us on some sound, on sound financial footing and implemented a lot of the progressive employee practices. Um, but uh, we have that nonprofit DNA at the heart of everything we do, and um, and just I wanted to really how do you say institute our mission as an activist engine to, to make the world better by uh, implementing a salary cap so that no matter how profitable we got, that I will never make more than five times the lowest paid position at Bronner's, um, which is currently, you know, well paid. Um, and, uh, you know, we have good wages, you know, no deductible health care, really, really good uh, uh, wages and benefits here, but that no matter how profitable we get, um, everything we don't need for the business will go to the causes and right. charities we believe in. Yeah. I think it's so important to have that sense of, uh, you know, consciousness, you know, not only for the planet, you know, and for, but for each other, which I think the psilocybin experience really opens you up for that feeling of, of realizing that it is all connected. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a, um, uh, it, you know, it seems like it, it can sort of filter through your body and bioremediate any issue that is lingering inside any part of your body, whether it's like, oh, my shoulder's hurting or a trauma, you know, it can, it can, you know, cause that's what it does in the soil, by the way, you know, it's bioremediation. It'll go and fix things that are toxic, break them down, create homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Cause when I, I always use that as an intention, I say, go forward and figure out what you need to fix. You're mm -hmm. smarter than me. You know, you just can go ahead and realign my body and my mind, my soul, and it always comes up with the right solution. Yeah, I think that is so amazing that the vast majority of people who have this experience uh, walk away with a sense of sacred connection. They walk away with a stronger sense of eco-awareness. They feel that they've experienced awe. It is very hard to actually put into words what the experience is. And it's so amazing that the experience is different for every individual. So it does meet you exactly where you're at, Louis, as you were saying, you know, it just, it comes in and it it, it regenerates I just say, our, our, our soul. It meets you there because it's you. 
This is yeah. the, it feels like it's some bigger force and it is, it is that too. And this gets to the idea of wholeness is that we are rooted into nature itself. We are articulation of the cosmos. Fruiting bodies. That's, That's right. right. And, and to realize that is really the definition of healing. Yeah. You know, the word healing comes from the same ancient root as the word whole. So to heal is to move in the direction of wholeness. And so this really connects all these kind of spiritual conversations we're having and connecting it back to the therapeutic enterprise. Yeah. To heal is to become more whole. So to have a direct experience of greater wholeness, I don't know if we ever feel fully whole, but it's it's a direction, right? You know when you move in that direction. Right. And, and, your, and your, your psyche works like that. We're fragmented, right? Internally, we're fragmented. And you can feel integration. And it's not made out of words. It's an experience. It happens organismically. And that's what the psilocybin experience is able to loosen up within yourself. It's not, it's, it's magic, but it's not magic. It's inside yeah. of you. It's how we heal. It's how we are uh, in spirit. It really, yeah. it really strongly emphasizes that we are not disconnected from nature, that right. we are a part of the mycelial network. And when I think about uh, people who've been diagnosed with a, a terminal illness, and I think about how uh, many of these individuals in the clinical studies hadn't even ever had a, a psychedelic experience, but they went into it and the, the vast majority came away with, I'm okay. And this is just a part of life. Death is a part of life. And as Dr. Anthony Bosses says, you know, in America, we, we don't die well. And as a result, we don't live well. Mm -hmm. And when we can, when we can reconcile our, our spirit and our mind with death, and that it is just a beautiful part of the human process, and then to go into this expanded consciousness realm, and feel connected to the stars and and to the planets and to the water and to the to the nebulas and to everything. You come out of it and you say, I'm gonna live the rest of my days with purpose and with intention. And I'm not gonna push down deep inside the fact that I am going to die. I'm just gonna let it come out and let it be I, a part. Yeah, we're, part. We're, we're all walking, we're spiritual beings, you know, obviously in a body. And it's amazing how, as you pointed out, individually, it's a beautiful medicine. But I want to just talk for let's just talk for a second about the fact that you guys are catalyzing a movement, okay, a global movement. You know, I'm proud to say this fantastic fun guy, Michael Pollan's book, the work that you're doing is you know is catching this giant wave, and the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative is going to perhaps be the model for other states. You know, moving forward, we know that it's been decriminalized in D.C., you know, in Oakland, Denver. Um, and, you know, David, you've been supporting MAPS and all these, you know, groups. What I love ab about this movement, because it really relates to the spiritual conversation we've been having, I think is the issue of resilience. No matter how much you try to stomp it down, it's going to pop up. It's like any religious practice that's been, you know, uh, you know, persecuted, guess what? It's unstoppable. If people mm -hmm. can, you know, practice their spiritual belief, no matter what governments and oppression, you know, does. And, you know, again, coming from our, our shared faith, I can relate to that, you know? So let's talk about the movement for a moment, how it's galvanizing a movement and how it could, could be the answer for a global, a, a global answer of a reboot coming out of this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. you know, just, just just before we go there, I just wanted yeah. to just say, just on the last, uh, just my first, I'll be brief on my first yeah. self driving experience, just relating to the Unity experience. And I was a I was a biology major at Harvard, and had you know, rejected my Christian faith at the age of thirteen. You know, God so loved the world. Like, why did he send his own son to this one spot? What about the Chinese and the other planets and stuff? Um, and, <laughs> I remember uh, um, looking down on my arm, you know, my friend gave me mushroom chocolate. And I remember looking down on my arm and like, you know, and thinking like, you know, what does it mean at a quantum level? Like there's no difference between me and the world. It's just like one energy. And when I eat and I poop, it's like the world is cycling through me. I'm not even the same stuff like month to month. I'm, 
you know, different blood, different, all that. I'm like just in this energetic interchange with the world and the world's not this dead inert deal out there to just exploit and whatever, not think about, but I'm actually part of a much bigger reality process. That's like, I'm just like, you know, this, you know, there's a, such a bigger living reality uh, that I'm part of. And, you know, I had this first kind of unity experience that, um, yeah, anyways, that we were talking about. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, it, that's yeah. exact. That's exactly it. It's a recognition. And that's why, you know, speaking of resilience, you know, you look at prohibition mm -hmm. and it's this blip on a much longer story involving psychedelics, but also just human consciousness and what we actually are. And you can't really suppress that. I mean, it's going to, it's not going to disappear. We have an in, intrinsic curiosity about what we are. Right? So, so yeah, it, it was, it was, it, you know, to, it was a bold move to, to sit down and it was humbling and it was a lot of responsibility. We didn't take this lightly to trigger what we knew would be, you know, stir up a lot of energy. Yeah. And we, we started, like Tom had shared, we started this process, legally started it in 2015. But we did take this long um, runway because we wanted to let the the movement unfold and the science, science develop, develop. attitude shift. And, yeah. and that happened, you know, we, we had an intuition that we, we saw the direction of the science and that really led the way. We knew that attitudes would shift as the science became more understood. But that being said, it, it didn't mean that there was going to be this wide open welcoming of right. let's do this. And so you have to have a resilient spirit. You have to be a hundred percent, a thousand percent, a million percent dedicated to what the, what source has convicted you. This is your mission right now. Do it. And it wasn't always easy. And during those rough moments, being resilient, being remembering why we started this process, remembering that it was not about the process, but about the end and getting this uh, therapeutic uh, modality into the hands of as many people gonna, as can benefit from it. Yeah, it's going to save the world. Yeah. I have a philosophy around, I mean, really, this was an exercise of intention, you know, because at one point it only existed in our heads <laughs> and i remember where there's there was self-awareness around that certainly it's building off of you know eons of psychedelic use and the science and all that but the idea of, of putting a campaign on the ground you know when we first thought of that of course you go to google and see if anyone's doing anything like that and it became very clear that Nobody there was would. not a single word on planet earth about <laughs> doing a ballot initiative and so and, and we knew we would follow through, you know, if we really decided to do it. That's why we didn't take that decision lightly. We took our time deciding if we we're really going to do it because we knew we'd follow all the way through. Great. So there was this moment of self-awareness where this different reality, this different possibility for mental health care and beyond existed inside of us. And so that's a very interesting feeling, speaking of resilience and creative process and intent. And I guess... Just really quickly, my general philosophy is that if you throw something into the world that doesn't exist yet, you have a vision, right? The world is going to show you all the reasons why it doesn't exist. And that's going to be perceived as resistance, right? But if you know that, you can learn to embrace and accept the resistance as, as the teaching process that, that is necessary for creation. And if you can, and I'm not perfect at this is a philosophy that I aspire to try to practice it. And certainly we got frustrated a lot along <laughs> yeah. the way, but, but that helped us kind of move along. Well, I'd also like to say during this process, David, I don't know if you know this, I don't know if we've ever shared this with you and all the times we've been with you, but in the second year of when Tom and I were on the road and educating Oregonians about what we were going to do in 2015, we knew in our heart that David Bronner and Dr. Bronner's would be a part of it. We just knew. And that was like uh, something we knew for a couple of years before we even met you. But that was that intention that we set out because your, your company is so in alignment with what resonates with us. And we just 
new. And it, it's fantastic to see how when you set an intention, when you put it out to the universe, it actually works. And our worlds collided and now we're quantumly entangled forever. I mean, how cool is that? We, we didn't know much. We're not politicians. Yeah. We have no idea how to do a ballot initiative. Yeah. So it was <laughs> like we just yeah. a leap of faith. The architecture, the vision, and, you know, and, and I think to the movement question, I think, you know, the therapeutic model that Tom and Shree, you know, really, you know, you know, just taking what's been pioneered in John Hopkins, but just making it available to everybody. I mean, that was the crucial move. And I think that therapeutic container is really crucial. It, uh, it's kind of the Western analog to the indigenous ceremonial container where, you know, especially with high doses, you, you really want to be optimizing your intention, your set and setting. Um, really controlling for factors that can be distracting or can experience sideways and it just really allow that super deep work and release into the experience fully and you know have someone hold a space so there's some random noise or whatever you're just not no need to worry about it um, and just you know just do the deep work and then have that integration after um, is, is is crucial um, so I, I mean that is the model what, what Thomas Shri developed here and, and is now the case in Oregon. Now we want to see that replicated. Um, you know, the other other integration paths are obviously the FDA route. You know, that's also crucial and we'll continue to really, I mean, that's kind of the big wedge culture blocker or breaker, um, like the initial one. And then now Oregon is really kind of, you know, kind of hit it to the next level. Um, and in DC, that was the decriminalized nature. And so they're kind of holding more of the ceremonial uh, ceremonial container. Um, it's uh, about decriminalizing plant medicines and access and allowing for, you know, religious use and ceremony and healing that way. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I think that's the, an, another crucial cultural, how do you say, that's the way ayahuasca is moving in mm -hmm. the culture. Um, you know, Tom and I have this saying, David, that there's only one psychedelic movement, but mm -hmm. it's like a wheel, right? And so there are many spokes in the wheel and we have, we have to be united in all one or the wheel won't turn right. And yeah. so, you it's know, good. we've got, we've got the FDA model. That's one spoke in the wheel. We've got the, um, the decriminalization model. That's one spoke in the wheel. And we've got and the organ model, which is definitely one spoke in the one psychedelic uh, Renaissance movement. Yeah. And I think when we look at it, when we step back and we look at the largeness of what we're doing right now in terms of policy reform around psychedelics, I think that um, we are helping so many people who have had no idea that psychedelics can be used in such a beautiful way. We're helping them to, to accept it. We're putting down the stigma. We're renewing and uplifting the beauty of what's been used and uh, ain't for for millennia by the indigenous um, groups to to bring healing to their communities and like you know if you go out to a, 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 an Amazon um, experience with ayahuasca you, there's there's not mental health workers there it's about having a sacred experience and the community saying hey part of this community needs help. And we're trying to bring that type of modality through the organ model into I, w this Western kind of. I think there's different, view. different. I, you know, what's a mental health worker? Uh, you know, it's not necessarily someone with a particular degree, although it certainly can be. In this case, you know, and this is another aspect of this measure is that we want to bring the underground, above ground, and ensure that there's uh, safety standards. Uh, practice standards, ethical standards, but not based just on medical credentialing. Yeah. This is a new container and an ancient container yeah. all at once, certainly new to our Western, uh, more modern culture. Um, but yeah, we're, so competency is, is highly valued in this measure. You know, the training will be intensive to become a facilitator, to really learn how to sit with somebody. Because a lot can't, you know, it's 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 a it's a delicate process to to really optimize. We can't mess this up, right? We have to we have to unfold in a way that we don't develop kind of symptoms along the way. And we were mindful of that from the beginning. We thought a lot. I mean, the real inspiration to do a ballot initiative 
as opposed to wait for FDA approval or uh, was because kind of philosophically, we wanted to see a, this integrated into the culture in a way that makes sense, that fits the particular intervention or the particular uh, experience uh, to open it up to anyone who can safely benefit and to create pathways for the right people to facilitate and, and uh, supervise these sessions. Uh, so that's what we did. You know, yeah, I'm super excited, Louie, about your project that's coming out in the, in the new year, because when you shared that with Tom and I, we were like, our, our brain just started well, moving and we have so many things we want to talk to you about in that regard. Mm -hmm. But to go into an experience and we, you and I talked about this, like in many places, it, it will be you're walking into a hospital, you'll be walking into a clinic. And then, and the, the idea is to make the ambiance right mm -hmm. within those settings and to be able to have the about? experience of going yeah, into especially on the demonstrating come up, you know, I mean, that's kind of like sometimes like the hard, hardest part of the deal, right? It's like, you know, to come up and feeling all the weird stuff and having some grounding, beautiful nature imagery to really kind of help that smooth that whole process on, you know, the onset. Yeah. I think that's crucial, and and you know the just just quickly also I mean Oregon the, the other you know mega campaign and, and breakthrough was 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 Measure One Ten that was the treatment not jail uh, shift of the drug war from incarceration and criminalization of drug use and addiction to a compassionate rational treatment approach. You know if you have a relative struggling with alcohol, you don't call the cops and have them arrested. You, you get them in the treatment, yes. and that's exactly what we should be doing for all other substance use disorders. And, you know, and what's better for substance use disorders than psilocybin therapy and other, and other psychedelic assisted therapies. And I saw in the chat, someone uh, had asked about, uh, you know, psychedelics and addiction. And, you know, and I think, you know, we're obviously just really beginning to understand the, the therapeutic process. But, you know, when we know it's correlated to the mystical experience, you know, that therapeutic outcome um, and that kind of egoless, you know, transcendent state, and you know michael pollan has kind of summarized a lot of the scientific thinking on the on the matter that we have this what i guess what's called the default mode network in the brain that corresponds to ego consciousness you know our kind of command control you know you know kind of making sure the trans, trains run on time and you get you need to be where you're at and you're taking care of the whatever and that whole mode of consciousness um but it's also uh, you know, that's also what a lot of trauma is, a lot of, how do you say, self-destructive habits of thought and behavior getting trained in and taking that offline, like what psilocybin experience does is kind of disables that and allows areas of the brain to be talking to each other, be connected in a much more hyperactive state and communicative state and, you know, state of consciousness that's, you know, non-dual. It's, it's, it's a partakes of a, you know, much deeper awareness and healing and that inner healer is activated and I think that the kind of obsessive compulsive behaviors and, and thoughts it, that these medicines can just really open up a window of opportunity to re put in place more pro-social uh, thoughts and behaviors. And even the way the brain is damaged by addictive substance use, you know, long-term addictions, I think that psychedelics can even at a neuroplasticity level just kind of help forge new brain pathways that correspond to these more healthy behaviors yeah but there's no magic bullets i mean that's psychedelic therapy has to be part of a holistic approach to, to wellness um you know you still gotta work on your diet and your fitness and your meditation and gotta do all the other stuff that's but right. psychedelic therapy in in the mix is just really enables people to have that window of opportunity uh, and it, it's not a panacea as you say david and it's not so we, we do need to recognize that as, as a community and, and as a society that there is no magic bullet, as, as David oh. says. However, if you, if you think about going into this experience with what's in your mind is this beautiful nature presentation for the first 40 minutes, it's going to deeply influence and impact the way that a person goes in, opens up their uh, default that shuts down the default mode network opens up this connected movement that's going on in the brain and rem and and subconsciously remembers that earthly vision that was there in that first 40 minutes i'm so interested to see how this uh study unfolds we're, we're very excited um 
Yeah. You know, it's not it's not a purely clinical approach. We these these centers that can be licensed, you know, they could be in hospitals, they could be in clinics, but they could be in in more natural settings as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And so we're really excited about, you know, that side of things, yeah. about optimizing yeah. the experience, really, you know, looking at it from a less purely clinical approach, but more right. in a connective psycho spiritual so, you know, what kind of so, setting we can create for that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm thrilled because, look, even in this pandemic, forget psilocybin for the moment or whatever. I mean, right now, you know, we're not able to travel. We're not able, you know, most people don't have a chance, you know, to go to, you know, nature or exotic locations. And um, the fact that I can, we can bring nature into the built environment is important. Plus, the imagery that I capture is I try to capture that spirit that is below the surface. So time lapse, slow mo, micro, macro, to, to to let the brain like let go and go. Oh, is this a flower? Yeah, been there, done that. Moving on to the next subject. Mm -hmm. No, this thing is like dancing and moving in front of your face. Did you know that they dance and move to the light? You know, <laughs> did you know that you know a water drop can like you know be a beautiful sculpture? Like one drop of water splashing becomes something that you can marvel at. That again takes you into the divine. That is like the gateway, and it's similar to the experience with psilocybin, or maybe can enhance it. So, given the fact that there are strict protocols, given the fact that there are safety issues, obviously, we can't let you know people run around, you know, uh, in the forest uh, yeah. unsupervised. But better than that, I, I kind of feel like I'm bringing the best into that space because I'm I'm showing you, I'm making the invisible visible which is the point of, in a sense, the psychedelic journey, right? You know, you, all of a sudden you can be in your backyard and you're looking at the trees, which you've looked at every day, but you've never seen them sway and breathe before. You've never yeah. seen mountains yeah. breathe before. Yeah, no, I mean, that whole taking, taking for granted consciousness, yeah. you know, we, we're, we're, we live in a miracle, you know, all the time that we just are obviously not tapped into or paying attention. And, and yeah, the South Side and like just, puts you into a mindset like holy wow you know it's just you know the heaven on earth it's it's, it's here it's now um and you know i want to say though under measure 110 that uh, you can uh take uh, uh 12 grams of mushrooms which is quite a lot for most people and you would probably not want to do more than four and if you're doing four you're probably not running maybe three but maybe four you can run around in the forest but you certainly you can still run around the forest and uh and it also allows 40 units of lsd under measure 110 is decriminalized. So, so 12 grams, you know, that's, that's over a quarter of a mushroom. So wow. big. Oh, oh, oh. So you, you, you get, I mean, while we are really wanting to have people take advantage of the therapeutic container and, and, and all that, especially for psychedelically naive population, I think that's a real important point here that uh, what the therapy model here is, is it's much more accessible to people like my mom Who's this, you know, I can't go to my mom and say, hey, mom, you know, mushrooms are decriminalized, you know, here, here you go. Like it's, uh, you know, that's just not accessible or comfortable for or, or religious ceremony. And as powerful as that is, it's it's not, how do you say, um, the entry point for a huge swath of the population. And I think that that's a, a real important point of what the therapeutic model is, is it's, it's not that we're opposed to being able to run around in the forest naked. I mean, absolutely. I want to do that more. And, uh, you know, and I'm really happy that we've decriminalized medicines and you don't have to worry about police arrest. You can do it in your you know, home or your forest or, you know, a Grateful Dead concert. You know, I think that's hugely important. But that that therapeutic container, you know, not, not only enables like really, really powerful and profound experiences, but it's also much more accessible and, and approachable for the more psychedelically naive. Uh, I agree, David, because, because Tom and I have received many 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 emails from people who say i want to have this experience but i'm not comfortable doing it on my own no. and this is this is for that um large swath of people that david um said for them to be able to come in and know that they're in good good hands that they're going to be uh doing this journey alone so to say but with somebody else in the room right. making sure that everything that they um, experience feels just having that person in the room brings a strong sense of security mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and for many 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 people 
That is so important. And yeah. so as David says, you know, it's not that one thing is better than the other. It's that there are different needs in society. I think, you know, again, we're talking about measure 109, which is psilocybin therapy, which is our measure that passed. And then measure 110 passed, which decrims uh, across the board and, and funnels money toward addiction services and things like that. Put it all together in Oregon, which we did. These both passed. Now we have a new horizon in Oregon that is really a public health based approach to substances. Yeah. That's where we need to go. That's why this is absolutely a template. To yeah. Spread. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we launched the movie, we launched it in Denver because it was the first city that decriminalized it. And we knew we'd have, uh, you know, the folks at Spore, you know, where, you know, they help with the screening. But I, I wanted to share a small anecdote. So, we're doing, you know, I traveled to all these places and we held a space for the conversations to occur. And um, what I learned at that one in Denver was, you know, it, it got more votes, you know, than the mayor did. And um, so all of a sudden they freaked out. They go, oh, my God, now what do we do? So they had a meeting with, like, the mayor, the, you know, uh, police commissioner, you know, the head of social services are going, what do we do? What if someone has a bad trip, you know? And I think it's never been an arrest or a recording bad trip in Denver's history. But they're all, like, freaking out, like, what, what do we do? What, the, what happened is that the conversation shifted to, well, what do you do with all the people with mental health issues in Denver? What about the homeless that are on the street? None of these departments had ever come together to have the conversation. They never met collectively. So the, the, uh, the psilocybin measure that passed enabled this bureaucracy to come together and talk about the broader issue. I know, know isn't that perfect? Isn't that beautiful? Like to, to have this, have the governor be... Uh, interested in it, first of all, is wonderful to have the Oregon Health Authority immediately get on it in, in less than three weeks, get this advisory board um, call to action out there, allocate the uh, a good m amount of money, $5 million to the program over two 8. years, 6. and for to bring all of these disciplines together and state and, and hopefully federal officials to talk about, yeah, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And what's the right. training be like? I think, you know, it's a psychedelic mm -hmm. part in there, in this, how they act in, in the individual. I mean, they're such integrators, you know, like they, you know, all the things you're not paying attention to, they're in your shadow, of, you know, individual or collective or just things that are going on. It just all gets brought in the consciousness. You know, I just say like, you know, all right, I'm just trusting you. Show me what's up. What do I need to be working on? Uh, you, know, you know, I add to my prayers, like, hopefully you don't kick my ass too hard. So I get the love and gratitude, but kick it as hard as it needs to get kicked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but showing showing those integrating forces even in the body politic here, like in Denver and in, in Oregon, and yeah, it's awesome. I, I want to be able I want to be able to you know get our audience uh, questions in. There's a couple that are really I think important. There's a lot that's flowing in. I really love this. You know, a lot of folks have asked about like how does it help with um, you know addiction. I think we've covered that to great degree, talking about trauma. But uh, especially for, for Tom and Cherie, there was a question from Jack from Oregon. He said that the Oregon governor, Kate Brown, is currently in the process of appointing an advisory board to oversee psilocybin treatment in the state. How are you all working in Oregon to ensure that actual experts are on the board and not naysayers or capitalist profiteers, i.e. the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, great question. Um, well, let me first say that the vibe so far is really good. Uh, the governor, for example, put out, like Cherie mentioned, her, uh, her, her budget, her, her aims at least, and allotted $5.6 million to the program, which is a big message sent that says they want to see this happen and they're not trying to block it. They're not trying to de not fund it, kind of things like that, or at least she's saying that. So that's a strong message to the legislature. So that's positive. And then, it, you know, the, the advisory board were, um, you know, certainly motivating the right people to, to apply, you know, and, uh, but, you know, it's out of our hands, but our feeling from just c conversing with the governor's office and the people involved is that they're really excited. They think this is a, this is a, uh, a program that they want to do right. So, uh, so far, all the, the vibes are good. We'll good. see how things unfold, but so far, so good. 
Yeah, and I think there's, uh, I mean, there's definitely a, a post-campaign effort. Uh, you know, it's it's rather sophisticated and um, well-funded, or will be, to just make sure that we do get the right people uh, appointed um, to to these crucial positions. We do want to, obviously, we have in mind. You know, obviously, you know, Paul Stamets would be awesome on the uh, as our mycologist slot. Um, you know, Francois Brizat and, and and others. Um, uh, there's uh, who was our end of life physician, Thomas Shree, uh, Doctor yeah. Gideon's. You know, this and these are great recommendations. I just want to be clear that this isn't us. You know, appointing. You know, there's so many good people because we hear people inquire. There's so many good people applying. Yeah. Uh, there will be a great pool of people to choose. Yeah, right on, Tom. And I, I don't want to, yeah, we, we, we just want to make sure not bad people. Is, uh, yeah, we definitely want to motivate everyone yeah. we can. And we're, and, we're, we're, and, and we're definitely taking the steps. I mean, on yeah. both 109 and 110, it's so crucial that these are implemented correct, you know, that we, we move shift to this treatment, not jail approach. Uh, at the same time, we integrate cell side therapy. I mean, this is the first time, and it's 100% crucial that these are implemented in, in a way that really shows the world how to do it. Well, so there's I like- I also say to that something. question that yeah. it's the people's measure, right? And so the advisory board's gonna be saying, how do we uh, how do we create licenses for people to apply for? How do we make sure that diversion doesn't happen? How do we have quality control of the product? Training. And what do we do about training? That's their focus. And then, then it comes back to the community. When those licenses are issued in 2023, we the people have to be the ones who say, we're gonna make this a people, community, accessible, accessible equitable, equitable uh, system. Yeah. So yeah. facilitators and uh, producers and service centers, it's up to us. And we got to good make sure that it's it's not going to go that way that yeah. makes uh, people anxious and nervous. Can, can I just jump in with a quick note that on the clinical trial we're doing? You know, I've got you know the top leading neuroscience surgeon in the country, Daniel Kelly, but along with that, also Francoise, you know, Borzat, who is you know one of the leading experts in indigenous practices, is helping to shape the experience as well. So we're leaning to the state of the art in Western medicine and leaning back thousands of years to someone like Francoise who worked with, you know, uh, Maria Sabina, you know, in, with the Mazatecs in, in Mexico. I love the idea we can bridge both worlds. It isn't one yeah. or the other. Mm -hmm. Francoise was very involved in our development as well. So yeah, it's yeah. great voice to, to really get that diversity of approaches. You know, the, the rules and regs are really all about maintaining a safe container with ethical standards and, and practice standards, but there are different ways to kind of see the container and that's okay. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, we're opening a, a space for uh, different kinds of environments to take shape that are safe and that can optimize this experience and that there's an ethical backbone to it. And that's what we're trying to do is create that platform. And I think also in the measure, it's very clear uh, the action that we took, the steps that we took to make sure that it didn't get overcapitalized, right? So we limited uh, people who want to have service centers cannot have more than five service centers in the state of Oregon. People who want to have production sites can only have one. And so the, the residency. goal and, and have to have residency here in Oregon. You have to be an Oregon resident in order to get any of these licenses. And I, so what we really did is we focused on how can we make sure this stays community-based and doesn't go the route that uh, becomes very uh, pharmaceutical in a negative way or, or super capitalized. Right? And that's, that's the beauty of a ballot initiative is you can be surgical and protect the spirit of what you're trying to do. Right. And, and, and I think we worked hard to do that. And a lot of people don't understand that that limitation of various licenses actually works to to make sure that we don't have these um, overzealous uh, people come from outside and try to take over the industry here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So here's another question uh, from 
Arjuna on YouTube says, how, how will we implement this across the world economic forum? And, and you, go ahead. Yeah, well, we've, uh, uh, so Dr. Brown, we've invested in a series of front companies that have taken off over the communion manufacturer, uh, all the major communion manufacturing. So we're gonna go ahead and swap into psilocybin uh, in uh, delayed release. And um, once the inventory stocks and churches across the world fill up, we'll uh, you know go ahead and press the button. But no, I, I, and we would never do that because setting is so important. And you never ever want to uh, uh, do that to anybody. But yeah, you know, I think it's just <laughs> that was a joke, right? Yeah. yeah great. Okay. So, so the, but the psychedelic renaissance is global. I mean, obviously, it's our you know, it's in, in a, like we've been talking about. I mean, this is archaic, indigenous, you know. Like we're we're living the outlier. Our, our Western culture is this outlier, psychedelic. Uh, how do you say, um, naive, um, non, not, you know, most cultures have had these medicines permeating and influencing and helping shape human experience and consciousness and conduct. Um, and I think as we lift the drug war and the draconian controls and the underlying you know malaise of at the heart of the Western condition our anxiety and insecurity and uh, alienation from nature and heal that up that will and remove these, uh, how do you say, prohibitionist draconian controls that naturally will see uh, a globe, this psychedelic renaissance spread out across the world. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's unstoppable because what's beautiful is that nobody, no human being introduced us to each other, you know, yeah. And the mycelial network kind of reached out. I think it made that connection. And in the release of the movie, you know, we just released it, you know, several weeks ago in the UK. You know, I, I did like a Zoom call with um, the Psychedelic Society of London. You know, mm -hmm. we're about to go to Germany, Japan. It'd be interesting yeah. to see what happens in Japan. But it's like every one of these places has a psychedelic community. And they are not only like great fans, they are passionate beyond any environmental group I've ever dealt with. Because as I said earlier, you can't step on someone's spiritual experience and have them ask them to suppress it and not talk to people for fear of going to jail or losing your job, you know, for, you know, which has been the past history for decades. And now finally, it's like you're able to come out of the closet, just as the gay movement did, just mm -hmm. as, um, you know, cannabis exploded. It's like okay to talk about this stuff, which and is really it's, it's it's like a pressure cooker. I yeah. think it's going to explode. Your mm -hmm. film, Louie, really helps all people to see that every step we take with our feet on the planet, we are stepping on this mycelial network. That uh, if we just stand there for a moment, and I do this, it's called grounding. And you go outside and you find some non-concrete area and you just stand there and you let the energy of, of the earth come up into your body. And it's a beautiful sensation when you do it with intention. And that's, that's the mycelial work coming up through the human being, which is a part of nature. So your film, Fantastic Fungi, allows individuals to see that beneath our feet, out of our vision, is this whole way of, communicating and caring one tree for another and plants for each other and absorbing things that die, regenerating and bringing up new life. And it, it just opens a huge door for um, understanding our planet more. I agree. And I think what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the wisdom from below the ground, above the ground. This yeah. mycelial network is a shared economy without greed where ecosystems flourish. Nature's operating instructions. It's right there. So thank again the Fetzer Institute for helping us sponsor the podcast to help build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. I also want to thank Leland, Annie, Courtney, and Sarah from Moving Art, and Bethany, Ron, Deanna from Magical Threads. Um, may the uh, world shine a light in 2021. I think we've, we're have at the end of that dark tunnel. Uh, mm -hmm. It's important that we have that sense of optimism and solutions. And, you know, nature, 
nature's wisdom will always be there because as long as we protect what we love, we'll be on the right path. So, Amen. That's right. Thank uh, you, guys. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh,